In the heart of an ancient nation, a sacred fire burns. It hasn't been extinguished for over 2,000 years. Its mysteries inspired the faith of millions and lie at the very root of what Christians, Muslims and Jews believe in today. If I am to find it, I'll have to set out on a two and a half thousand mile journey, a journey which takes me behind a lifting veil of Islamic fundamentalism, to a place where time and history began. I'm David Adams. I'm a photojournalist, and my work takes me on journeys to some of the most remote corners of the world. Now it takes me to a place where many have been afraid to visit, Iran. Now Iran's not strictly at the ends of the earth, but because it's been effectively off limits to so many Westerners for so long, it's still a land shrouded in mystery. My journey starts in the Iranian capital, Tehran, where I discover one of its more lethal amateur sports, extreme jaywalking. Well, into the valley of death. This is a daily game of chicken between determined flesh and unrelenting steel. There are police and stoplights, but no one seems to pay much attention to them. So for extreme conditions, it's best to show extreme confidence. No, don't try that at home. God. Finding myself still alive, I go and see the sights and discover that some Western visitors are still unwelcome. These were the walls of the United States Embassy in Tehran. Behind them, a group of revolutionaries once held 52 Americans hostage for over a year. The graffiti still proclaims Iran's hatred for America, a country they call the Great Satan and everywhere, the face of Ayatollah Khomeini, father of the Islamic Revolution. While strict Islamic law can still jail a woman who forgets to cover her head, or whip a man who drinks a beer, that law is now being observed less strictly. The old Iran is re-emerging from behind the fundamentalist veil. An ancient land with roots reaching right back to the beginning of time. Centuries before Jesus, a man was born here whose genius still shapes our world. His name was Zarathustra. We call him Zoroaster. Fire was his fascination. In its flickering mystery, he saw things which few had seen before. A single supreme being. A heaven for the good and a hell for the wicked. A divine savior and a last judgment.
Jews and Christians have long embraced versions of these beliefs, beliefs which are still at the center of our civilization today. So for me, this is as much a spiritual journey as a physical one, as I head into Iran's remotest corners in my search for Zoroaster's eternal flame. My route takes me northwest into the Elbrus, a long finger of mountains on the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. Here, I hope to catch a bus deeper into the mountains. So I always have problems with the pronunciation. You know, it's the, the high end of all those words, all that you know. And no, that's right, because it doesn't exist in English. It's very difficult for you to pronounce it. With me so, is Afshin, you know, I, a I young English might, teacher from yeah, Tehran. But so how do I say, um, what time does the bus go? K autobus mire. K autobus mire. Aside from his English, Afshin was also a bodyguard to an Iranian president. Not a bad skills combination. Yeah. So I hire him as my translator. Salam. Salam. Hello. 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 The old ticket seller is totally blind, but he seems to know where everything is, except the bus. What is, can you ask him what these and the bag are? Yeah. The bus station isn't exactly brimming with people waiting to start a journey. Maybe they know something we don't. Oh, no, no, this is the way you're going to do it. You don't need the whole thing? No, 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 see? Try it, and do the skin out. Okay. And just eat the middle. Yeah, that's right. My suspicions are confirmed when even the ticket seller himself gives up waiting. It looks as if we're in for a long, long wait. So one hour, that's about what, 30 or 40 kilometers? Yeah. How long will that take? To walk? Two or three hours. To walk? Yeah. What are you, an Olympic sprinter? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's about a day's yeah. walk. Yeah, uh, well, maybe something will come along and we'll, uh, we'll get a lift. Yeah. It's a really kind of quiet place in the world, this, isn't it? We're stuck in the middle of nowhere, an Islamic revolutionary nowhere. They may have been able to enforce Quranic law, but they can't make the buses run on time. Then just as we're ready to give up hope, the mountains ring with the sweet sound of our salvation. It's not a bus, just a kind truck driver who takes pity on us wayward travellers. This is, this is down here. The back of his truck is hardly luxurious, but at least we're mobile again. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> It feels great to be on the move again as we head further northwest, deep into the Elbrus Mountains, one of the great barrier ranges of Central Asia. Some of these peaks are over 10,000 feet high, 
that's 3,000 metres. For centuries, the Elbrus have been a refuge for those who wanted to remain independent of cities on the plains. They've also been a sanctuary for anyone wanting to hide from authority or just wanting to be different. And these mountains have also been a place from which to plot mayhem. My journey's about to take me into the lair of the assassins and the fortress of a very dangerous man. At last, Afshin and I meet up with the friends we've come so far to see. While Razor is an expert mountaineer, his mentor, Aziz, is a legend. One of only four Iranians who've conquered Mount Everest. What better people to have for my next mission? Gear checked and packed, we set off for the place whose name means Eagle's Teaching. Alamut. Alamut is a rocky skyscraper thrusting 3,000 feet into the air. That's 1,000 meters. Maybe it's just the extraordinary shape, but as you toil up its slopes, you begin to understand why some people believe that certain spots on Earth possess uncanny powers. A challenge for the toughest of climbers, but for an army, it's mission impossible. If you're looking for a natural fortress, Alamut is it. This is quite a tough climb. But in the Middle Ages, anybody traveling in these mountains would have found it a lot tougher because they would have been wearing full body armor. Because the man who lived on the top of this mountain was the most feared in all the Middle East and even beyond. His name was Hassan al-Sabah, the old man of the mountains. And from Alamut, he launched a reign of terror. Back in the 12th century, the Turks ruled Iran, and the Crusaders held Jerusalem. To battle these invaders, Hassan invented a new weapon. <laughs> Political murder. His followers killed princes, generals, and grand viziers, even a Crusader king. No one was safe from Hassan al sabah Tradition has it that he acquired such powers over his followers by drugging them with hashish. As a result, a new word entered the English language. In Arabic, they were called hashishin. We call them assassins. And there's another story. If Hassan al Sabah wanted to impress a visitor, he had only to say the word and fanatical assassins would leap from Alamut to their death on the rocks below. I thought I'd see what it was like, in a more controlled sort of way, of course. It's good? Yes, yes, very good. <laughs> Razor and Aziz are veteran repellers, or abseilers. Before they'd agree to help me, they wanted to know if I'd done this before, I tell them I have, but what I didn't tell them is that it was a long time ago, in high school, when I was only 18. The difficulty in jumping off a cliff like this is, this is an 800-year-old castle, or probably more, and the whole thing is rubble on top, and at any moment the whole lip of it could actually fall down and fall on top of us as we, as we abseil down. But uh, with a bit of testing, we should be able to work out if it's going to hold or not. Okay. 
Yes. <coughs> Thank you. It's like being fitted by an Iranian tailor, I guess. It's on. Unfortunately for the assassins, they didn't have all this gear. And thank God I've got Razor instead of Hassan al-Sabah. So he's happy for me to go now? Yeah, yes. You're happy to go? Yeah. Beautiful thing. Okay. <laughs> it's always... Mm. <laughs> Don't you love Iranians? <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Let's go. Yes. Good. Okay. A little unfirm. I always knew that someday I'd go over the edge. As I descend from Alamut, I must admit that thoughts of stoned assassins hurtling to their oblivion do pass through my mind. But of more concern are the stones from this crumbling fortress hurtling down by my head. about doing this is that there's somewhere between fear and absolute elation. Whoa! Oh, and now I reach the bottom where hundreds of assassins met their doom. I think it makes your blood run hot doing this. I recommend it for medicinal purposes. Thanks guys! Fantastic. Oh, wow. <laughs> that evening, we build a fire in a cave from which it is said that Hassan al-Sabah once directed his campaigns of terror. Aziz sings songs about the mountains and as darkness falls, our seeing keeps the ghosts of Alamut at bay. And as I gaze into the fire, I remember why I'm here. Tomorrow I return to the source of a fiery mystery and the place where Zoroaster first kindled his sacred flames. <laughs> Further on into northwestern Iran, the snows from Central Asia sweep across the mountains as the winter temperatures plunge below zero. Now I head off alone on a personal mission to a place called Takht to Solomon, Solomon's throne. Legend has it that it was here King Solomon struck the ground with his staff. Instantly, steaming water poured from the earth, and the Queen of Sheba was able to have a hot bath. But there's another legend. Also beside this thermal lake, I find the ruins of a Zoroastrian temple. This is one of the places where the great mystic, Zoroaster, is supposed to have been born. In this pit, some of the most sacred fires of Zoroastrianism once burned. Eternal flames tended by priests called magis. Magic flames, for that's the source of the word magic. Flames never to be extinguished. And it's here at the so-called throne of a Jewish king that the myths of four religions merge.
It was from here, 2,000 years ago, that three magi set off in search of a newborn child, guided by a star. The star took them to Bethlehem. There they found a Christian son of God and a great prophet of Islam, Jesus. But further up the road, I go back another thousand years. This is the biblical land of Nod, where Cain slew Abel. The further I travel, the further back in time I seem to go. To the beginning of time itself, in fact. For somewhere around here is supposed to be the place where time began. The Garden of Eden. But the facts don't seem to match my expectations. A glimpse of paradise, perhaps? A garden where Adam and Eve once frolicked in a perfect world? Not this barren, windswept wilderness. I feel disappointed, and then I drive round a corner and see this. Oh, wow, look at this village. It's a village carved from living rock, the home of the Iranian troglodytes. Eons ago, these bizarre conical shapes were formed by lava spewed from an erupting volcano. Here we are at Kandafan. And out of these rocks, they carved their homes, which is why it's called Kandavan. The word means the place that is dug. Something out of Spielberg. What an unlikely looking paradise. The last place you'd expect to find a Garden of Eden. It's time I took some photographs. It's pretty quiet in Candavan. It's said that the river that feeds the Garden of Eden is supposed to flow through here. But I see no river, and I definitely see no garden. As I walk, I'm entranced by the fairy tale feeling of this place. I'm told people came to Candavan because there aren't any snakes here. Now the Garden of Eden legend is really wearing thin, but I'm curious about what lies behind those walls. I'm David. Ah, David. How much are you? Ah, thank you, yes. The Iranians are incredibly hospitable, and I'm constantly being invited into their private homes. Oh, this is your family. And that's how I come to meet Mr. Hashim. I'm Hashim. When you were much younger. Man has them, Hashim. Yeah. And this is Mecca? Mecca, Baba. Uh huh. Baba. Man not left them. Baba left them. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, Baba. Oh. Your father? Uh, Maud. Ah, uh, uh, he's, he's gone away. Right. Okay. Thank you, Hashim. That was great. Good office. Yeah. Hey, Jasti. Dem Shabia Sham. Hey, Hunima. Hunima. I don't understand. Sham. Oh, uh, dinner. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, that uh, would be great. Uh, OK. I think Mr. Okay. Hashim Thank is inviting you. me to you. dinner. So that evening, I come back with my guide, Afshin. Pies. Pies. And Mr. Hashim's pies. laid on quite a feast. So how is this made? Uh, well, well, so he's invited some shepherds to meet me, Musa and Rahim. So it isn't long before the conversation gets around to sheep. To Australia, because fans are there. Now, have you Brazil? got any sheep in Australia? We've got more sheep mm -hmm. than any other place on on yeah, the. Yeah, as how many do you have? Bigger more goose fans there. Goose fans, no, but millions and millions and millions. You meet in a very much you don't have a voice. Can you sing for us here? Yeah. Can I sing? Yeah. <laughs> later, later. I sing. <laughs> yeah, I sing some Australian songs. Later. Later. <laughs> and then, with no ladies present, the conversation takes a rather masculine turn. Does Does he have a girlfriend? Uh, no. no, he doesn't. Would he like to have a girlfriend? <laughs> 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 
Why not? Why not? Uh, you ask a lot of questions about his girlfriend. So how about you? Do you have anyone, you know, <laughs> you would like to get married or something? Uh, it's difficult for me because I travel so much. So, mm. you know, I travel maybe nine months of the year. Mm -hmm. So it's very, no woman would tolerate that. <laughs> He doesn't look convinced. Marvel's out of it, that yeah. <laughs> And then the big surprise. Not only are they shepherds, they're musicians. Musa plays a six-stringed instrument called a saz, while Rahim plays the sauna, a shepherd's flute. I never do learn exactly what they were singing. I wanted to ask when they'd finished, but they have other plans. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Succeeded in totally destroying Iranian Australian. music and Australian myths at the same time. Once a jolly swagman camped by a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree. He sang as he sat and waited till his billy boiled. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. Oh, I said you had to go, At sunrise, I'm up early, along with the rest of Kandavan, as flocks are driven out to pasture and people go about the business of another day. Yeah. <laughs> I may not have found the Garden of Eden, but I'm getting closer to the real Iran. But if I want to explore deep into its spiritual soul, I must go further. I'm about to drive to a beautiful city where I have an appointment with the warrior wrestlers of Esfahan. I'm now heading south through a country that has been well trodden by some of history's greatest men. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Marco Polo, all have passed this way. And now, David Adams and Afshin? Uh, yeah, our language is not Arabic. It's completely different with the Arabic language. It and sounds very different. Yeah, it's completely different. But we use some of the Arabic words. Do you think it's a hard language to learn? No, no, no. It's very easy to learn. No. As we drive, Afshin does his best to teach me some of his own language, Farsi. So, what else would you like to know? Well, I'd like to know how to ask for a beer, but I can't get a beer in this no, country, can I? No. If, I'm, if we're going into someone's home, oh. what, what's a correct greeting? Babakhshid. Babakhshid. Mozahamitun Shodim. Mozahamitun Shodim. Shodim. Very good. Babakshi. 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 Mozahamitun Shodim. I'm never going to get this language. Language has never been my forte. My Farsi is terrible. His English is excellent. But I wonder what he's like at Australian. Don't come the raw prawn with me, sunshine. What? Don't come with me on the raw sunshine? <laughs> Don't come. Okay. The raw prawn. Don't come the raw prawn. Raw prawn. Raw prawn. You know, like a, it's a, 
a shrimp that's that's not cooked. Yeah. Okay, raw prawn. Yeah. Raw don't prawn. come the raw prawn with me, sunshine. Don't call. Come. Don't come the raw prawn with me, sunshine. You know what it means? No, I don't. It's kind of like don't pull my leg. You know, oh. you know someone is joking with you, uh -huh. and um, it's kind of saying, I know you're joking. Don't do it. Yeah, don't, don't do come it. Roll <laughs> prawn with me, you don't, sunshine. Yeah. As we mangle each other's languages, we arrive in one of Iran's most magnificent places of Islam, the holy city of Esfahan. Esfahan, Nesfajahan, the Iranians say. Esfahan is half the world. And on my first morning here, I'm inclined to agree. No other city in Iran compares with it, perhaps none in the whole Islamic world. It lies in the very heart of the country and at the heart and soul of Iranian civilization. While Shakespeare was a struggling playwright, and Sir Walter Raleigh had just set foot in Virginia, Shah Abbas was transforming Esfahan into Iran's new imperial capital. He designed it around a huge central square, still one of the largest squares in the world. On the surface, little has changed. In its bazaars, artisans still beat out copper bowls, as they've done for centuries. In Esfahan, I say goodbye to Afshin. Bye, see ya, bye. He must return to his English students in Tehran. In a way, the timing is good. I want to experience Esfahan's greatest glory on my own. I've seen my fair share of wonders in my travels around the world, but the Amman's mosque fills me with absolute awe. Completed in 1638, it took 26 years to build and remains one of the world's most perfect fusions of architecture and belief. Its acoustics are so good that its imams could preach to vast crowds here long before the invention of the microphone. Welcome to the Zukana. The name means the House of Power. For a thousand years or so, Iranian men have joined a Sukhana to prove their manhood and draw closer to God. walk in and sign up. Happy hopefuls must spend at least a month watching, meditating, and deciding whether they're made of the right stuff. At first, zukanas seem to be an odd mix of aerobics, circus acts, and trying to make yourself as dizzy as possible. But it's actually a very ancient way of life. Before the days of standing armies, it was the Zukhanis that transformed peasants into soldiers. It's really an Islamic version of martial arts. Their trainer is also their spiritual leader. As they do their workouts, 
he chants verses from the Shanama, an epic poem celebrating the deeds of a mythical Iranian superman. Finally, the spiritual climax. As the trainer beats out his hypnotic rhythm, they take turns at a feat made famous by Sufi mystics, the dance of the whirling dervishes. Sufis believe that as they dance, their souls leave their body and journey to God. And what is all this building up to? Wrestling, Iranian style. I've been watching too much wrestling on television, but after all the warm-up exercises, reigning wrestling seems to be a bit of an anti-climax. That's until I'm handed uh, these. I've never wrestled before. <laughs> yeah? Okay. The message is clear. This uh, might be journeys to the ends of my life, I think. This is the point when I'm in serious danger of making a fool of myself. And it will be all the more embarrassing if I can't fit into these Iranian wrestling togs. Okay. Iranian colors. My new friend, his name is Motion, helps me. But it's a tight fit. Just a little bit too much ice cream last night. Good? Good, very good. <laughs> okay. As we enter the ring, I pray that Motion won't be my opponent. But, of course, he is. This is waiting for death. So I'm squaring off with a man who's been wrestling since he was five years old, while I've been a wrestling spectator for about 15 minutes. But for some inexplicable reason, I'm not rolling around on the floor. Maybe they don't want to embarrass me. This is not very confusing. I have no idea what I'm doing. There's a problem. I've obviously committed some dreadful breach of etiquette. But after only a few minutes up against one of Esfahan's wrestling champions, the referee literally throws in the towel and declares the match a draw. <laughs> and I never did find out what I'd done wrong. The next day, Motion invites me to another Esfahan tradition. To get to it, we have to go by this bridge. But we don't just go over the bridge, we have to actually go inside it. And there we find a tea house. Here, retired wrestling champions pass the day away with tales of triumphs past. <laughs> What is the name? Gower. Gower Gower. Makes you very strong. Yes. But I couldn't lift it, but you can do it very well. Yes. <laughs> okay. When our tea arrives, I discover that I have to oh, learn okay. to drink it all over again. Iranian style. 
And you swallow it? Or you keep it on your tongue? Mm. No, I can't do that. <laughs> then, I'm just when I've mastered tea drinking, the dreaded hooker arrives. Oh dear, this looks lethal. Um, I feel like the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland. This is... So tobacco. Ooh. I don't smoke, you know. <laughs> There's an old Iranian saying, if you want to find God, look in a hooker. But I suspect there's no truth in it. This one's making me feel decidedly ill. Well, I'm starting to feel green. It takes me a few minutes to recover from the hooker, but its smoke has reminded me of my quest. Before I leave Esfahan, I've got one more stop to make. It's a tough climb, but the view is worth it. And once more, I feel the presence of Zoroaster. These are the ruins of an ancient temple, once more taking me back to a time that precedes Islam, where once the sacred flames burned. Tomorrow I set out for the source of that fire, a fire that hasn't been extinguished for thousands of years. I have an appointment with the people of the flame. Further southeast of Esfahan, in the heart of Iran, are the ruins of Persepolis, ancient capital of the mighty Persian Empire. Persepolis is actually its Greek name. In ancient Farsi, it was called Parsa. And 2,400 years ago, Parsa had running water, an effective drainage system, and not to mention one of the world's greatest libraries. From here, you could send a letter to the ends of the earth. That was until Alexander the Great destroyed Parsa in the third century BC. You know, I've always wanted to come to Persepolis. As a kid, I used to read about Alexander and what the Greeks did when they came here. But walking through these columns, you can just get an impression of what this place must have been like. I mean, these are 60, 70 feet, and the roof was on top of that. It's just mind-blowing, really. Persepolis, or Parsa, was also an important centre of the state belief, Zoroastrianism, which is the real reason I'm here. Near Parsa is a group of living Zoroastrians, worshipping before the tomb of a former Persian emperor, Darius the Great. It's a sign of a thaw in fundamentalist Iran. They were prevented from doing this until very recently. Thank you very much. It's very old. You are welcome to Iran. No. Thank yes, you. of course. 205,000 years ago. Really? 2,500 years ago, yes. This ceremony, it will be continued always. And uh, over here, as you see, over there, you see the moon. This strange moon, winged uh, figure the is the sacred of, uh, symbol of Zoroaster's uh, god. And as always, central to their worship is fire. Could you explain to me why you burn the fire every time that you pray? You believe in brightness. You see, always we must stand towards the light. The light. There's no difference. Now there is sun, we can stand towards the sun. Uh -huh. If there is no sun, we turn on the fire, 
and we uh, the always towards the light we stand. Yeah. The light of yes, moon, there should the be beam. Of always so there it's should always be, warmth yes. and light. Rays, rays of fire, rays of uh, sun, rays of whatever it is light. Mm -hmm. Towards the light we stand and pray. Because we believe that brightness brings happiness in life. That's a Due nice to way that, to look. yes. Yeah. yes. So at last I've found the people of the flame. But if I want to see the ancient flame itself, I must go further east. There I will find the original fire lit all those years ago by Zoroaster. I want to travel through this country the way Marco Polo and the old silk traders did. It has to be by camel. My route takes me into the desert along the old silk route between China and the West, where great camel caravans once carried men's fortunes on their backs. If Marco Polo were alive today, he'd find this valley unchanged. As I travel through these vast primordial spaces, I've almost forgotten the 21st century exists. And then I arrive at my destination. It's called Chak Chak, a cluster of buildings embedded into a massive mountain. This is the end of my journey. This is where I'll find the sacred flame. Chak Chak is one of the most important of all Zoroastrian shrines. Anyone entering it must be purified. So suitably washed, I leave my shoes at the door and enter the sanctuary. And there before me is the flame I've come all this way to see. All around me are the worshippers. I don't understand the words, but in their faces I see something that needs no translation. And now I gaze at a fire that's been burning for nearly two and a half thousand years, never extinguished. Fire kindled from fire, flame begetting flame in an ancient line of descent from that first fire of Zoroaster. I'm staring at their gift of God. And as I watch, I'm reminded of the man who first conceived those values we still hold sacred today. Long before the dawn of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, it was Zoroaster who first saw a single supreme being, a struggle between good and evil, a savior, a last judgment, a beginning and an end. And he saw it all in a flame, the flame into which I now gaze, a flame so eternal that it will burn until the ends of the earth.